Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Yes, Jesus, it is indeed all about you. And we pray that you'll be the center of our lives, the center of your church, the center of your people, the center of it all. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this time. And we pray that you would indeed touch my tongue to declare your praise this morning. And we pray that in fact this message would be something that truly is helpful to many people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we heard of the agony Jesus went through at Gethsemane. Jesus was so pressed during those hours of prayer that he actually sweat drops of blood. Three times he asked the Father that if it was possible for the cup of suffering to pass by him, that was what he wanted, but he added, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus would go through whatever the will of the Father was. Then Judas came and gave the people that were with him, the crowds, with their clubs and their swords, he gave them the sign that he had given them. He kissed Jesus. And Jesus was taken into custody and led away to trial. Verse 53 is where we start today. And this is what we read. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. This is an important piece of information here. Jesus' trial, at least before the Sanhedrin, it's not a private trial. There are many, many witnesses with Caiaphas. Many witnesses. And I find that it is interesting that they are all up at this hour. It's late. You know, don't they go to bed? Or, or were they all celebrating Passover? And so that's a, that's a meal that starts at, the, at night. So, you know, it's possible that they could have been awake. But it could have been, too, that they all knew what was going down and they were ready for it. So they could be called together in a moment's notice. Verse 54 says, Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is, you know, what is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Now this is in, indeed, it is fulfillment of the prophetic word from Isaiah 53, verse 7, that he would keep silent. And that particular passage from Isaiah 53, that's the suffering servant passage of Isaiah, and where we read he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Continuing with verse 61, again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. 
after being silent throughout this entire time before all of these people and hearing all of the false witnesses that were coming up against him, speaking their lies, why does Jesus suddenly speak? The answer isn't found in Mark's gospel. It's only given in Matthew's gospel, and there it's easy for us to miss who don't know the Torah. But the reason I think Mark doesn't give us any insight into why Jesus speaks up before this point is probably due to the fact that his audience, the ones that he is writing to, are Gentiles. And so this is not going to make a lot of sense to them if he went into some kind of explanation. Matthew's gospel, on the other hand, was written to Jews who knew the law because the way the, 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 way the synagogue operated Every single week there was a Torah portion read. Every single week. So if you're faithful to the synagogue and going to synagogue every Sabbath, then you hear that Torah portion. And you hear it over and over again. You know, when you get to the end of Deuteronomy, you start back at Genesis. Until you get to the end of Deuteronomy, then you start back at Genesis. You've got a Torah portion that you read every single Sabbath. So Matthew's gospel, written to Jews who knew the law, who needed to hear that Jesus had fulfilled all the law and the prophets, is the one who does a little more explaining. Now, I thank God that we have both Matthew and Mark, but I'm also glad that we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Because these help us to gain understanding. Unfortunately, we've missed this very important part, point because... We just truly aren't that familiar with the Torah, the law of Moses. Thank the good Lord, Dick Rubin, clearly explains what went on in his video when the pattern is right, the glory falls. Before I get to that explanation, let me read to you what's going on from the point of view of Matthew's gospel. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, that's when he speaks, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What had happened? He went from being silent to all of a sudden, wow, there he is, he's speaking. Now this is what happened, as we learned from Dick Rubin, and we did that back in 2013, so it's been a while. Caiaphas, the high priest, had invoked what was known to God's people as the first law of the trespass. The first law of the trespass. And there were ten of them. Okay? It's found in Leviticus chapter 5. And there we read, Now if a person sins after he hears a public adjuration to testify when he is a witness whether he has seen or otherwise known if he does not tell it then he will bear his guilt what does that mean it means that if you are a witness to something or you have knowledge of something and are commanded to tell it and if you didn't tell what you knew then you're guilty of breaking the trespass. One of those ten. Okay? So, as we know, people who break the law are not guiltless. They are guilty. They are sinners. Did Jesus come to fulfill the law? Yes. Yes. Did Jesus know exactly who he was and why he came into the world? Yes. He knew. So, he had knowledge... He had knowledge to answer the high priest's command. And the high priest, by virtue of the office he held, had the authority to command Jesus to speak about the things of which he knew. It was because Caiaphas invoked what was called the voice of swearing. 
and adjured Jesus to answer the question Caiaphas gave him. If he knew anything about what Caiaphas was talking about and what Caiaphas asked, uh, then Jesus had to speak about it. If he didn't, he's guilty. So Jesus begins to speak, and and then first, first Jesus points to Caiaphas and says, you have said it yourself. You have said it yourself. But then Jesus also added, nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. These are words from Psalm 110, verse 1, which reads, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus had spoken the truth. He had told the high priest exactly what he knew. He had not broken the first law of trespass or any other laws. He was blameless, not guilty, sinless. God's sacrifice for the sins of the world was ready to be sacrificed. But who's going to sacrifice God's sacrifice? It wasn't going to be Caiaphas or any man for that matter. Caiaphas, though the high priest, he's not legitimately the high priest. He was the high priest by appointment of Rome. So he wasn't high priest by the lineage of Aaron, which is what it was supposed to be. He's about to disqualify himself from the priesthood. What did he do? Let's go back to Mark's gospel because this is where Mark and Matthew agree absolutely together. You know, there's nothing, nothing different about them. Mark says, right, tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Some began to spit at him and blindfold and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. What happened? How had Caiaphas disqualified himself? He did it by tearing his garment, tearing the collar of his garment, which was reinforced so that it would not tear easily. He was mad, frustrated and mad, put out. He went, ah, and ripped it. So he tore the priesthood away from himself, so now another one's got to take his place. To have a high priest was vital to temple life, remember? Two times a day, in the morning and in the evening. Nine o'clock, three o'clock, or the third hour of the morning or the ninth hour of the day, there had to be an unblemished lamb sacrificed and consumed on God's altar. The high priest oversaw those two sacrifices. When both were finished, the high priest would would stretch out his hands and say, Nagmar, it is finished. He'd do that to both sacrifices. And he stood the entire day until that second sacrifice was finished and he said, Negmar is finished. Only then could he sit down. He wasn't legitimately the high priest through the line of Aaron, though the people did accept him as that because, you know, what are you going to do? You've got to have a temple. We've got to have a temple life. Um, but now that he's torn his collar, torn his robe, he can't preside at his own at the next morning's um, sacrifices. Who then could offer up the morning sacrifice? Well, of course, we know the answer to that. The morning sacrifice would be offered up by Jesus, our great high priest. And this, too, is actually found in Psalm 110. Only now it's in verse 4, where the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, when did Jesus become a priest? He's not of the line of Aaron. He's of the line of Judah. Ah, we know this answer too. He became a priest when he was baptized by John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist was the legitimate heir to the high priesthood through his father, Zechariah. And when he baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, that's when that uh, took place. He could become a priest because he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came on. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus would, bat would preside at his own sacrifice. And when he offered up his one, not two, one perfect sacrifice, he would sit down at the Father's right hand. So all was now ready. The priesthood had changed hands. The sacrifice was ready. God's plan was unfolding. And we could quit right now, but we've got to move on. Verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you're one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do, I do not know this man you are talking about. And immediately, a cock crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before a cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. Our understanding of what Jesus meant when he said, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times, has changed. Now we know the cock crow isn't in reference to a rooster crowing, but to a man in the temple calling out through a trumpet blast at a specific time in the morning to the priest to get up, get prepared for another day at the temple. Jesus has said Peter would deny him, and Peter did deny him. What could he do but go out and weep? Thankfully, this isn't the end of Peter. Our God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. But the fact that our God is a God of many, many chances, that's a topic for another message. Amen.